Hey everyone, I'm Adam. And I'm Ian. Welcome to the Ridge. Happy first Sunday of spring. You know, a little colder than I would prefer, but it has sprung and I'm ready for it. Evan, Sarah, and Grace are going to lead us in worship this morning. And Pastor Tim is continuing our series leading up to Easter called Foretold. We will be looking at some Old Testament stories from Israel's time in the wilderness that point to Jesus and the cross. It's going to be a great Sunday, but before we get started, Ian and I are here to let you know about some things happening around the Ridge. Speaking of Easter, it's only one wee week away, seven whole days. I know. And our Easter services are happening March 31st at our regular times at 9 a.m. and the 11. And for all parents out there, our kids programming will be available from six months old through third grade. So fourth and fifth grade, enjoy the service. Yeah, have a good it. time. Yep. Be there with your family. Absolutely. We have a special service plan to help celebrate the hope uh, we have in Jesus. And we encourage you to invite someone, bring a friend, a neighbor, someone you don't know, or invite them to watch online. And we can't wait to see you there. Absolutely. It's going to be an awesome Sunday. Hey, the events of Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday are called Holy Week and make up the most significant days in history. And as you prepare to celebrate Easter, we invite you to journey alongside us through Holy Week to retrace Jesus's final steps and reflect on the moments leading to his death, burial, and resurrection. So starting today, you can follow along with daily devotions from our staff online or by subscribing to our devotional email at theridge.church slash Holy Week. And I have the honor of kicking it off. Yeah, uh, Palm yeah. Sunday. It's written by me, so we hope you enjoy it. I just didn't skip that. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I don't believe <laughs> Hey, students, uh, if you haven't heard by now, uh, we're going to summer camp. Uh, we're going to Young Life's Wild Ridge Adventure Camp in Summersville, West Virginia from July 20th through 24th. It's going to be an incredible five days together, surrounded by God's beautiful creation and growing in our relationship with Him and with others. I want you guys to listen to this part. The deadline is tomorrow, all right, March 25th. So if you haven't signed up, head to the ridge.church slash camp to save your spot. Tomorrow. The, to, the, the next tomorrow, day. The 25th. Yeah, the 26th is too late. All right, don't do that. Uh, any and all college students are invited to join us tonight, not tomorrow, uh, for a night of worship at the Gluck Theater in the Mountain Layer. They're going to have food and a time of worship and want to see you in the room. It's going to be an amazing time of worship. You don't want to miss it. We hope to see you there. Well, I think that's everything for today. If you'd like to stay updated with everything happening here around the Ridge, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or subscribe to get our email. You can also check out our free app. Just search Chestnut Ridge Church. We have our weekly talks, services, devotionals, and more for you to check out throughout the week. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the service. Bye. Welcome to The Ridge. We're glad that you're here. I invite you all to stand and sing with us.
Galatians 5.1 says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. And one of the analogies that the Apostle Paul uses in much of his writing is that of being enslaved or imprisoned to sin. That's something that's true of all of us as humans. But the incredible news of Jesus that I just read and that we've been singing about is that Christ came to set us free from sin and from death. And now I, I don't know what it looks like in your life, like the particular ways that sin tries to bind you and hold you back. I only know what that looks like for me, but it's incredible that God through Christ has opened the prison door and is inviting us to step out of the cell and to walk into freedom, into life, full and abundant from here through eternity. When I was growing up, I, I didn't really think like that. I thought more, God was more like somebody looking over my shoulder all the time, like waiting for me to mess up, trying to keep me from life, trying to restrain me with rules. But the opposite is true. Christ came to set us free from our sin to set us free from death, from shame, from guilt, from your insecurity, from the need to be accepted by other people, from the insatiable drive for success and money and, and power and whatever other thing it is, Christ came to set us free from that. And that is a God that's worth worshiping this morning. So let's continue to worship and praise him with our song.
God, we thank you that you are the same God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you have been faithful in eternity past. You will be faithful in eternity future. And God, I just ask that you can help any veil, any thought that we don't need you be torn away from us and us to just really see how truly, desperately we need you in our sin, and even after we have begun a relationship with you through faith in your son Christ, we need you more and more and more every day, God. So help us to see that and help us to, as we see our need for you, to turn away from the things of this world and to turn and fix our eyes on your son Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It's in his name that we pray, amen. If you're in the room, you can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome. Thank you guys for joining us. We're so, uh, it's just so fun to be here, to be together, to be singing together, worshiping together. It's amazing. My name's Arch. If we haven't gotten the chance to meet one of the pastors here at the Ridge, if you're in middle school or high school, you can head to the hub at this time uh, for your groups. We love having you guys in here for worship. And fun fact, for those of you who don't know, we just started or restarted a high school worship band that led worship with their peers for the first time this past Tuesday, which was a bunch of fun. They did very great. We're proud of them. This series that we're in the middle of foretold is amazing. I've really enjoyed it. We're kind of taking a look at the whole Bible and kind of this narrative, one story that goes from Genesis to Revelation. It's all telling one story, and that's the story of Jesus. And this has been a great series, and it's all going to be leading up and culminating into next Sunday, Easter Sunday, where Pastor Tim is going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And if you were here with us last week, Adam, while he was hosting, he kind of shared how just incredible of an opportunity Easter Sunday is to invite people who don't know Jesus to church. A lot of people will come and kind of check church out for the first time or first time in a long time on, on a Christmas or an Easter. And so it's a great opportunity. And as I was thinking about who I wanted to invite, I got a little convicted because I don't know about you, but, but sometimes for me, 
when I'm inviting someone, I can forget to pray and I can kind of just do it all on my own. Like I can think that God's not, or like not that I'm joining God on his mission, but he's joining me on mine. And so as I was thinking about that, my encouragement would be to you this week as we go from Sunday to Sunday to be praying for those who you would invite, to be asking God who he would have you invite, to be praying for their hearts. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Ephesians chapter three. Um, It is one of uh, my favorite prayers that Paul offers uh, for the Ephesian church. It starts in verse 14 and here's what he says when my Bible loads up. This is a nice thing about a real Bible. You don't have to wait for it to load. Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to be praying that prayer for the people that I'm thinking of inviting this week, and I would invite you to do the same. Here in just a minute, Pastor Tim's going to be continuing that series foretold, but before that, we're going to continue to worship God through our giving. When I was growing up, our family always had pets. We started with cats until uh, my parents realized I was very allergic to cats. They thought it was tomatoes for too long. (laughs) Uh, My eyes would be swelling shut and everything else. Don't eat the tomatoes, but it was the cats. But eventually we got rid of the cats and we got a couple of dogs. And we had this little toy poodle that was named Sparky. The name really fit. This was just a little energetic, almost... um, I don't know, disturbing how energetic this dog was. I, I consider it like a firecracker type of dog. And then our other dog was Sandy. He, he was called Sandy because of the color of his fur. I think one of my brothers came up with that name. And he was the bigger of the two. Well, one day Sandy got loose. And it was winter and it was starting to snow. But we weren't too concerned because this was, first of all, before there were leash laws. Uh, Second, Sandy never caused trouble. Sandy was not the kind of dog that would chase after someone and bite him or something like that. So we weren't concerned. And third, he always came when we called, except this one night. We called and we called and Sandy did not come and we became concerned. And so my dad jumped in the car and began to drive around the neighborhood looking for Sandy. A couple of my brothers put on their winter coats and went out looking for him as well. And I stayed back home and continued to call for him just in case Sandy came back in the meantime, but none of us were successful. Time passed and there was still no Sandy, and so we were standing there trying to figure out what to do because we'd looked at everything else, no dog. And then we saw Sandy in the distance. Behind our house was this huge field, and we saw Sandy starting to walk toward us, which was unusual because Sandy usually would just shoot up Uh, to the house very fast, but he was walking very slowly, and it wasn't until he got close that we realized what the problem was. His foot was hanging from the leg. It was just just dangling there, bloody, a mess. We thought, what on earth happened to, to the foot here? It explained everything. We began to think about it, you know, what could have happened? Maybe, maybe Sandy ran across one of the busy streets, because there were some busy streets nearby and got clipped by a car. Uh, Or, and this was more disturbing, we thought it's possible that a couple of the neighborhood kids did this. 
there were a couple kids in that neighborhood that, that would do something like that. And, and so I was angry when I thought about that. But um, my dad took care of the dog and had to get the dog to the vet. And then my brothers and I put on our coats and I believe we got even flashlights because it was nighttime now and the snow was coming down. But we thought, let's go ahead and follow the, tr the trail. And so we could see the footprints of the dog. Occasionally we saw drips of blood as we were going along. And so we knew we were on the right path. We cut di diagonally through the field and then took a sharp turn into the woods. At that point, we couldn't, of course, follow the, the footprints because there wasn't enough snow. So now we were just looking for blood. And we spread out and eventually someone yelled, one of the brothers, hey, come on over here, everybody. And when we got to this spot, there was just blood all over. We wondered what on earth happened and we continued to look because it was kind of a mystery. And then one of us found a trap. A couple of the kids in the neighborhood used to set these big metal traps to catch small animals, you know, like skunks or raccoons, and they would sell the pelts. And it was one of those kind of traps where you, you put your foot on it and it would open up, the jaws would open, it, would, it, was, it had teeth, you know, and, and we figured that what happened is our dog made the mistake of stepping in one of those traps and that the owner found our dog and released him but didn't want to tell us what had happened. I think that's, that's what happened. But we'd solved the mystery and it was basically by following the path. Now, his foot ended up being okay. Thankfully, he had a little cast or something, if I remember correctly, and I don't think he had full use, but it, it was okay because I think the artery hadn't been severed or whatever, but they were able to, to fix the foot and everything was fine. Over the past few weeks, we've been doing this series uh, talking about stories in the Old Testament that lead us to, you know, provide like a path to the story most important story in the Bible, that God was going to send His own Son to die in our place for our sin and rise again from the dead so that through faith in Him we could have eternal life. That story is all over in the pages of the Bible. God did not want us to miss it. My takeaway today is that Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. There are stories and symbols and prophecies and teaching and all of it points to this big story. And of course, the way in which it's most displayed is through the sacrificial system of the Old Testament where animals were, were sacrificed. They spilled their blood. And it was pointing to Christ who had shed His blood for us on the cross. And last week we looked at an example of this, the story of the Passover. How the people of Israel were in Egypt and the night in which they were set free from slavery was the night in which the angel of death passed through the land and then he passed over any houses that were marked by the blood of a lamb on the top and the sides. The angel of death would pass over that house and those inside would live. And Jesus is our Passover lamb. And Paul it was explicit about that one in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He said, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. And all of it points to this, this main story here. But I think the entire story of Moses and all the sub-stories also point to the same thing. My, Moses himself, Moses himself is a picture or a type of Christ. Moses himself was intended to point to Jesus Christ. And so if you look at the two of them, you realize they had an awful lot in common. Both of them were saviors. Although Jesus is the salvation he provides is infinitely greater. Both of them were teachers. And they received God's word from the mountain. Moses, of course, Mount Sinai. Jesus, we talk about this, this uh, sermon on the mount that Jesus gave. We think about the miracles that both of them performed, pointing to the reality that God had selected each of them to lead his people, Israel. And I think of the covenant. You see, God gave Moses the covenant, an agreement between God and people. I will be your God. You're going to be my people. And Moses, you remember, he sealed that covenant with the spreading of blood. He, he actually threw blood on the crowd that was gathered because without that shedding of blood, the covenant could not be agreed upon. There has to be a sacrifice or a death. I think of Jesus in the New Testament holding up that cup, saying this is the new covenant in my blood. Take this in remembrance of me. All of it points to this. But today I want to focus on three stories 
from the Old Testament that are part of that bigger story involving Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. Let me set the context for all the stories. If you were here last week, you know that the people of Israel had been in Egypt for hundreds of years, but they were enslaved probably only for about they say 86 to 116 years. So they weren't enslaved the whole time, but toward the end, in quite a bit of time, over 100 years probably, they were enslaved. And God had sent Moses to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. That's the God of Israel says, let them go. He refused, so God sent 10 plagues, you remember, upon the Egyptians. And finally, the last one was this Passover event I just talked about. And so now we find the people of Israel, they're making their way across this wilderness area and they're heading to what we call the promised land. But it was the land that God promised to give Abraham centuries earlier, 430 years earlier, God told Abraham, this is going to be your land and your descendants are going to live here. And now they were on their way to this promised land. But a number of things happened along the way and the stories point again to Jesus. The first point I want to make about this has to do with food or a story about food. And the point is this, that Jesus is the manna from heaven. If you know the story of the manna, I'm going to read it here in a minute. But it, it was intended to point to Jesus and I'll prove that in a minute. But let's begin reading in Exodus 15. Beginning in verse 1, we read, The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. Now, one thing you're going to see from the three examples I'm going to give, and maybe all the examples that would be in the Old Testament, is they, they start with a problem that Israel had called sin. They start with Israel grumbling and complaining. So they go to Moses. It says they're complaining against God. They're complaining against Moses. What should they have done instead? They should have asked God. This was the God that cared for him. It made a covenant with them. All they needed to do was ask, Lord, we have a need here. And it was a legitimate need, no doubt about it. How do you feed all these people? Some have estimated there were almost two million it came out of Egypt. Some say it's a lot less than that, but it's a lot of people. And how do you feed them all? And so their need was legitimate, but the way in which they approached it was sin. And I think of this because when I'm sharing the good news about Christ, the gospel message, I start there. I say, well, before you get to the good news, you've got to get to the bad news. All have sinned. We all fall short of God's standard of righteousness. And all these stories kind of illustrate that. In either case, though, God was kind to them and he rained, it says, bread from heaven. It was, they called it manna. According to a website called HebrewWordLessons.com, in Hebrew, manna literally means, what is it? They woke up the next morning and there's like, what is it? You know, and, and the image, it, the Bible seems to make it pretty clear that they were like flakes of some kind and they tasted like honey. The image that comes to my mind is, uh, you know those instant potato flakes you can get? <laughs> My mom used to make those, the instant potatoes, the flakes. That's what, it strikes me that that's kind of what is they walk out and there's these potato flakes everywhere, you know? Other passages indicate that they were also, somehow they resembled coriander seed. And here's a picture of coriander seed. Now, obviously, if they're flakes, they didn't quite look like this, but maybe in color or maybe in taste they did. In either case, this manna, was provided for 40 years and it came to be known as bread from heaven. And it was essential to sustain their physical life. They needed bread. We go forward in the New Testament and we find out that this is a picture of Jesus. In John chapter 6, we read that Jesus um, fed a group, a large group of 5,000 men plus women plus children. So it was between 15 and 20,000 people. 
And he broke the bread. You remember, they got in groups of 50 and he fed them all using the disciples to pass it all out. It was a wonderful, amazing miracle. Well, we read that the next day, Jesus and his disciples had taken off for another place, but they found him. They were looking for Jesus. But when they arrived, Jesus made it clear that they were not actually looking for Jesus. They were looking for free food. He said, You're not, you didn't come looking for me because I performed this miracle. You're coming because of the free food. Like, and then they began to argue with Jesus about who was greater, Moses or Jesus. And their argument went along these lines. Moses gave them bread from heaven for 40 years. You've provided one meal. You're not that big a deal. Can you imagine that attitude after this amazing miracle? But that's what they thought about him. What they did not understand is that Jesus was the bread of life and, and the sustenance that he provided was infinitely greater than just feeding someone's belly for 40 years. And so that's what he says to them in John 6, 47 to 51. He said, I assure you, everyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him for life of the world is my flesh. Now, they struggled with these words because they couldn't get out of their limited thinking that he was talking about physical bread. They just couldn't, couldn't understand that. He was talking about sacrificing himself, his life for the sins of the world so that we could have eternal life through him. In verse 57, he then adds, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It's not like the manna your fathers ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Then skipping to verse 33, he said, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That's the, that's the real bread of God. You see, initially they said to Jesus, well, Moses gave the people bread for 40 years, and Jesus corrected their theology. He said, Moses didn't give them that bread. It came from the Father. The Father gave that bread, and he did it again through me. And if you partake of me, if you receive me, if you view me as the bread of life, then you will live forever and not just die eating regular food. But let's look at a second story. On several occasions as the people were making their way through Egypt, they had a uh, problem with uh, water. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't find water to drink. Again, it was a legitimate need. You know, how do, you, how, how do two million people get water if, you, if there's nothing there? You come to one of those wadis. A wadi is like a, a river bed that dries and, and there's no water in there. How, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And so once again, they grumbled. And this was their habit of every time something went wrong. They just grumbled, grumbled, and they complained. And God doesn't like grumbling. Again, the right response is to pray. Ask God about it. Don't, don't you realize he, He's a heavenly Father. He knows what we need before we even ask, and He cares about us deeply. But they didn't do that. On two occasions, though, where they needed water, but there was no water to be found anywhere, the way in which God provided the water was very unique. He had water come out of a, a rock, you know. And so the illustration in the second story is this, that Jesus is the rock from whom living or life-giving water flows. Now let's read about this. The people of Israel had come to a place called Rephidim, and again they complained. And so we pick up the story in verse 3 of Exodus 17. We read, but the people thirsted there for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you ever bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while, they're going to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. I'm going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. 
When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he was to strike the rock. Picture the fact that Jesus Christ was going to be stricken for us. Now we move to the New Testament and we come to a story where Jesus was talking with this woman from Samaria. Some of you are familiar with the story. Jesus and his disciples were passing through that region. Most devout Jews would avoid Samaria entirely because the Samaritans were, were a mixture of Jewish Gentile people and so they weren't viewed as being pure. They were unclean from the perspective of a typical Jewish person. But Jesus went through that area because he loved those people and they arrived at this um, well and Jesus sent his disciples to a nearby city to go get some food, the city of Sychar. And so Jesus was standing there, but the text indicates that he got thirsty. And then all of a sudden, this, this woman shows up, a Samaritan woman, and he asks her for a drink of water. She was shocked by the question. She, she was shocked by the question for two reasons. One is that in biblical times, a man like Jesus, a rabbi, but a typical man would not talk with a woman out in public like that. You just didn't do that. So that was part of it. But the other thing is she was a Samaritan. And so she asked him, how is it you being a, a Jewish man ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And realize that back then, uh, the Jewish nation believed that if you used a utensil that a Samaritan had even used, it would be unclean. They wouldn't even touch a cup that a Samaritan had used. And yet Jesus is saying, could you use your utensil and go and give, give me some water? She was really shocked by it. And when she asked that question in John 4.10, we have Jesus' response. We read, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you'd ask him and he would give you living water. In other words, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd be coming to me. You'd be asking me for water. And she said at that point, well, I sure like that water you can give because I don't want to come here all the time and draw water. But Jesus, of course, was not talking about physical water. He's talking about living water. Jesus promised, I can give you living water. Living water in the Bible and, uh, was a reference to running water, and, and it, it had to be running water to be pure. And so all, all the sacred things that involve water involve running water, or they called it living water. It was life-giving water. And Jesus said, I can give that to you. He said, whoever believes in me, out from his inner being will flow rivers of water. And then the text goes on to say he was referring actually to the Holy Spirit, a person would receive when they put their faith in Christ. But the water that Jesus wanted to give was so much greater than the physical water. Going back though to our story about getting water from the rock and then moving back to the New Testament, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10.4. He said, for they, referring to the people of Israel, drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All along, it was a picture of Jesus Christ who was going to be coming to provide living water, life-giving water, not just physical water, but eternal life in the water that he was able to give. But let's look at one last story. When the people of Israel continued and continued and continued to complain over and over again, God did something very unique. He sent these snakes that, that bit the people. We read about it in Numbers 21, 5 and 6. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread or water and we detest this wretched food, which was probably the manna. It's like we're sick of it, man, every single day I can't stand it. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and they bit them so that many Israelites died. Now you might read a story like that and think, well, that's kind of extreme. But when I read this story, my mind goes to another part of the gospel message that I share with people, namely that the wages of sin is death. You see, all of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. But the penalty, what we've earned because of our sin is death. And so Jesus was displaying really justice here. Now, it was after great patience because they complained and complained. I mean, when I read this section from the Old Testament, I, every time I read it, I think, you big babies. You're just a bunch of 
big babies. Like, I, would, I couldn't tolerate you. I'm glad I'm not Moses. He had much more patience than I would have had. Big babies. Now, I have to admit that if I were part of the crowd, I'm not confident <laughs> that I wouldn't have been a big baby too. I don't know. But in either case, they complained and people were being bit by these snakes and, and they were dying. And so they went to Moses and said, we know we've sinned. Uh, please pray. And so Moses did. And we pick up the story, Numbers 21, 8 and 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, and this was in response to his prayer, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. Now let me ask you the question, what did they need to do to be healed from the death that they had earned? What did they need to do to experience God's healing in this story? Did they have to work for it? Did they have to promise never to grumble again? What did they need to do? All they had to do is look. All they had by faith to do is believe God's solution. If someone said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, a bronze snake. Bronze, by the way, is the medal of judgment in the Bible. So this was a picture. They would have looked at it and realized it's a picture of the judgment. You know? But if you thought this was ridiculous and you wouldn't look up, you would die. All they had to do, though, was look. Well, Jesus used this as an illustration in the New Testament. You may remember he was talking with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And, and Nicodemus was a, a teacher of leaders in Israel. He's, he's actually called Israel's teacher. And he knew a lot, but he comes up to Jesus and, and he says something about how you couldn't do what you're doing except that God is with you. And Jesus responded as if he didn't even listen to what Nicodemus said. He just looked right at him. He said, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Of all people that should have gotten to heaven based on their good deeds and holiness and whatever else, it would have been Nicodemus. And Jesus looked right at him and said, you're not going to heaven. You know, unless you're born again. Now, Nicodemus couldn't sort it out. Like, well, how do you get born again? Now, that phrase, by the way, born again, you've probably heard it your whole lives, but it can be translated born anew or born from on high. And it's that third sense in which it's used, not just born again or born anew, but it's born from on high. And, and then Jesus gave a, a, a good illustration of it. He said, well, you know what it's like to be born physically, right? Like, nobody can live if they're not born. If somebody's alive, it's because they were born. You know how that works, right? And then Jesus said the same thing is true spiritually. You won't get to heaven unless you're born from God. Born from on high. You need a new birth. You need a spiritual birth. In addition to the physical, you need a spiritual birth. And so Nicodemus wondered, well, how do you get that? I mean, uh, uh, what do you have to do? And Jesus answered in John 3, 14 and 15, he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Through this we see that Jesus is the bronze servant, serpent of our salvation. He was represented by that, raised up so that people could look upon him. Now, there's still a mystery related to this because it sounds like God told Moses to make an idol. And then everyone looked to the idol. That's, this was not an idol. I like the way CS, the csbible.com puts it, that this was like a vaccine, that snake on the pole. Like a vaccine except after the fact a form of the cause of the affliction will be the source of its cure. I know, you, I know let me read that again, because it's one of those things like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. We well, you know how a vaccine works, right? You, I mean, you get it ahead of time, it usually includes some of the bad stuff. Some of the disease is part of the vaccine, sometimes alive, sometimes not. And, and you get it to prevent getting the disease, but they're saying that this, like a vaccine, except after the fact, a form, the snake was a form of the cause of the affliction. The snake was the thing that caused the death. And it became the source of the cure. 
And the point is this, that Jesus Christ took on flesh and blood in the likeness of sinful humanity. He didn't sin, but he took on flesh in the likeness of sinful humanity so that he could die for the sins of the world. That's what he came to do. He became the inoculation for us as well. Now, how did again the people receive this healing from death? Well, all they had to do is look. This is how you get right with God. It's not what you do. It's not church attendance. It's not being a good person. It's looking upon Jesus. And the very next verse is the most famous verse in the Bible. After he talked about the serpent and how he'd be raised up, then we read in John 3, 16, For God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. All you have to do is look to Jesus. And that's how, how we get right with God. Look to Jesus. Skipping a little ahead to John 6 and verse 40, Jesus said this, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Eternal life is found through Jesus. But you have to look to him, you have to receive him. Now, there are more stories. I, I mean, I think it's been a couple years just saying, well, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. These three, of course, all point to Jesus pretty clearly, at least to me. He's the manna from heaven. Just as physical bread, bread in the Old Testament was equated to life. Life-giving bread. Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. Jesus was the rock from whom the living water flowed. And just like we need to drink physical water to live, we need Christ if we're to have eternal flow of water within us. And then Jesus is this bronze serpent of our salvation. We've all sinned. We all deserve death, physical, spiritual, and eternal death. All of us have earned that, but Jesus died for us. And if we just look to him... And every time I read these stories, I think of this one statement again, my takeaway, Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. So two applications here, maybe three. Uh, one is just ask the question, has there come a point in your life where you turn to Jesus to save you, to rescue you? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever puts their trust in him, look to Jesus. And if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that today. If you're already a Christian here today, though, you, you know you've put your faith in Christ. You know where you stand. I want us to understand that Jesus being these three things is not just the entrance into eternal life, but Jesus wants to provide life day by day and moment by moment. He wants to be your daily sustenance. He wants to be the bread of life. He wants to be the living water that flows out through you. And, and we don't turn to him. The God who gives eternal life wants to give us an abundant life. And so moment by moment and day by day, we turn to Jesus. Last application I want to mention is that these Israelites, they grumbled and complained all the time. And it really was a, a reflection of the fact, again, that they didn't love or trust their God. They didn't trust their Heavenly Father. And I think when we complain, we do the same thing. And so Paul, Paul wrote, don't complain about anything. Don't grumble about anything. But in everything, bring it to God. And He's able to meet our needs. Jane.
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Amen. Thank you, band, for leading us in worship this morning. Thank you, Tim, for the great message. Uh, if you didn't know, today is Palm Sunday. It's the start of what we in the church think of as Holy Week. And so we're going to take kind of this whole week to think about and prepare for what we're celebrating next Sunday on Easter. And to help do that, we on our staff created uh, a Holy Week devotional. And if you go to the ridge.church slash Holy Week, you can find it. And so each day we're going to kind of have some devotional content and some scripture that is centered around kind of what Jesus was doing this week as he was preparing for the cross. So I'd encourage you to take some time each day to read that. You can listen to it. We'll have some of it on social media. Um, and, and in that time, that would be a great time to, as I thought before, to be praying for those people that you're looking to invite next week. We're so excited for that, and we're very pumped for how God is going to use the Easter service here at the Ridge to reach more people for Him. We hope you all have a wonderful week.